Well, nothing gets folks going as much as the stimulus plan. The emails have been pouring in since the details of the plan came out yesterday. Mm, true, very true. Our Fox panel here now to react to some of your thoughts. We have Lee Gallagher, who's from Fortune, Jill Schlesinger from Strategic Point Investment Advisors, and Peter Schiff is the author of Crash Proof, along with Quentin Hardy from Forbes. And John Rutledge is the chairman of Rutledge Capital. Everybody, we want to let you know that we got many emails and we've gotten them very smart people saying, most of them at least, saying they won't be spending the check the way lawmakers were hoping. So let's get to some of them. Eason in Tampa writes from Florida saying she will use the money to pay bills, not, you know, spend and put more into the economy. Jay in Tennessee, David. Jay in Tennessee asks, who is more likely to blow the money, someone who makes less than 150000 or someone who makes more than that? Now, do these viewers have a point? Let's go to the first point, and uh, uh, let me go to Peter Schiff first. Evidence is that in the past, when we have given out rebates, two-thirds of the rebate money went into savings or to pay off credit card debts. Only one-third was used to spend. Is that a stimulus? Well, first of all, spending is never a stimulus. It hurts the economy if we spend, especially if we have to borrow to do it. But imagine this. Here you are, a typical American homeowner. You're facing an arm that's about to reset. You can barely afford the, the mortgage you've got. Your heating oil bills are going up. Your food bills are going up. You're in debt. Your credit cards are maxed out. All of a sudden, you get an extra 800 bucks. You're supposed to spend that too? Buy, you know, buy a new television set? I mean, how does that improve your situation? The responsible thing to do would be to take that money and pay off some of the debt you already have, not blow that money too. Lee, do you believe that uh, basically what Eason is saying, this, this emailer saying, you know what, if you're smart, you're going to pay off some of the debt. You're not going to go out to uh, you know, Costco or Best Buy and buy full screen. That may be true, but I mean, I think the debt is a huge problem here, and we basically treat credit cards like cash anyway. So $800 to a middle-class household, if some of that's going to go to debt, maybe they'll still make charges on the card. They probably will because the debt is so overwhelming that it just sort of seems like a bottomless pit anyway. Quentin Hardy, I know you think it's kind of Christmas time and, uh, well, after Christmas anyway, these, these Christmas rebates. Christmas in May, yeah. <laughs> but, but will they, will we, the, the folks who get these checks do what they've done in the past, that is save about two-thirds, and if you just have a third left over, is that going to stimulate the economy? Well, David, first off, you know, watch what they do, not what they say, okay? I'm going to pay off credit card debt, maybe, but 600 bucks shows up, you might just go out and have some Chinese, too, right? And secondly, <laughs> who that's, says that's paying Chinese, off your credit yes. A lot. Okay, you don't go for the duck. Uh, but who says that paying off your credit card debt isn't spending? You're buying back your debt. And that strengthens up the credit card company. They can loan more. There is an accelerator in that, too. Putting the money in that way is not necessarily a bad thing. Shores up everybody's financial position. Sounds good. John Rutledge, what do you think about it? I think 600 bucks is an iPod and a tank of gas. <laughs> <laughs> and that most people, most people are going to spend it. I actually spoke yesterday with Ed Lazier, the ch uh, president's chairman uh, of the Council Economic of Council. They were thinking that people spend about two thirds of it, but you've got to look at the whole mm -hmm. transaction. Every dollar that we give people writing a check, we borrow by increasing the mm -hmm. amount of treasury bills sold. So the borrowing there, if they didn't spend any of it, would be exactly offset by the credit card pay downs. It wouldn't affect the, affect the net debt position at all. I'm a skeptic about uh, stimulating the economy by boosting uh, spending. I think the problem we've got is really in the asset markets, especially the mortgage market, and that's where we should be focusing yeah. on. Yeah, we will, we will oh, but uh, Jill, Jill, the point is, is that um, you look at it very simply. The government takes money and then it gives money out, and there are handling charges because there's some bureaucrat somewhere that has to not only take the money but then cut the checks and send them out. So, are, isn't this a net loss? I don't think it's going to be a net loss, but I'm not sure it's going to be a net gain. And, and I was thinking that maybe we could have this new um, gift card with Uncle Sam's picture on it, which is just kind of <laughs> wow. the new way to do it. That would really be—that's what this is. It's a gift. It's not a rebate. It's a gift. But and it's a gift of our money. It's easy to give a gift I, if you use I, somebody else's money to give it. But, but now we're
we're talking about, is it going to work? And I yeah. am suspect that it's going to work. I think the best part of this, the most important part of it, is that psychologically there is a weird yeah. little blip of a boost in this kind of thing. I don't think it's going to work. The most interesting part of the whole stimulus plan is the expansion of what classifies as a, more, a jumbo mortgage. It's, Let's move on else. to yeah. another email. We've got another email, David. This one suggests that lawmakers are, are simply out of touch on stimulus. Kevin points out that 75000 is, quote, minimum wage in cities <laughs> like... Wow. New York and Quentin, San Francisco, due to the high cost of housing. He suggests, quote, politicians have been in D.C. too long and aren't aware of wide ranges of income. Is the stimulus plan just plain not fair to some Americans, Peter? Well, you know, you, you said it. First of all, government aid is like trying to give yourself a blood transfusion from your right arm to your That's right. That's right. You still have the blood on the floor. There you go. But, you know, like Rutledge said, if, if we keep paying for these stimulus packages by printing money, pretty soon all you're going to get for that 600 bucks is the tank of gas. <laughs> and Rutledge, what about the fact that there is a cutoff that uh, folks above 150,000 for a couple or 75,000 single don't get don't get anything they get bupkis so that of, of course was a compromise between the Democrats coming in wanting uh, food stamps and unemployment benefits and the Republicans wanting business tax cuts as it turned out you've got about two-thirds consumer action and one-third business cuts the business cuts are a little different because they just accelerate spending. They'll lower growth next year, but the consumers, yeah, it's it's been limited to the three thousand to seventy-five thousand dollar category, but that's still one hundred and seventeen million families. If I hear one more person David? from inside the Beltway, hold on, Quentin, say timely, and, and how timely uh, is that going to well, be? Uh, it, we're not going to get these checks until about June. Well, that's so, a great point, Liz. will I mean, people spend in advance, expecting that they'll get them? Absolutely not. They'll spend it when they see it. I mean, this is supposed to be, you know, for for things yeah. that you wouldn't buy normally. So. I mean, no. I mean, we're going to get these in May, June. Uh, the problem is right now, and you know. But remember, we've got the cart before the horse here. What drives an economy is production. Uh, spending is, is, is the the ends, not the means. That's the reward for production. We have to first save and produce. <laughs> we just can't stimulate. Quentin, the economy I heard spending. you wanting to chime in. Go ahead. Well, one more thing's been going on while we're talking. If you look down straight below you, you'll see the price of gold popping up occasionally. Oh, yeah. That's the dollar weakening in anticipation of this. Gold spits hard right now. It's going to hit a thousand bucks. And that's just going to keep happening. They'd be smart to spend it now because otherwise inflation is going to start eating <laughs> away at right. it. I think Peter would agree with you 100% on that one. All right. By the way, folks, if you have anything to say on the stimulus, if you think it's good, bad, or somewhere in between, email us, Liz and Dave, at Fox biz.com we love bringing your questions to the folks that we have here because your your opinions definitely matter and as you see with the stock market going down about 133 points everybody's wondering if that has something to do with it in the meantime the months winding down for our nation's 43rd president this monday his final state of the union address so what does president bush have to say about the stimulus plan next So let's go to our panel here. Indeed, to find out what's going to happen. Well, we don't have any football games, so we can rest up this weekend. But what do you expect, Peter, on Monday? Well, I mean, on the market? I mean, I don't know. I mean, anything could happen on Monday. <laughs> no, thanks, <laughs> Peter. Peter, like, play but, with us, please. Remember, Just play along. Remember, we're in a bear market, right? You know, in bull market, you know, climbs a wall of worry. Well, a bear market slides a slope of hope. In, in a bull market, right, it's the, it's the declines that are sharp. Right? Everybody gets scared. Uh -huh. It's the opposite. So in a bear market, you get these big, sharp rallies. So you don't get really excited when these rallies come. See, you They're have a lot to say, <laughs> Jill, you were just nodding in agreement here. Well, I think that, think? first of all, it's hard to say like what is going to happen. I we tend to believe, actually, it's not going to be that interesting a week next week and until the Fed speaks. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned that there could be a major sell-off in stocks if the Fed only gives us 25 basis points, because now all of a sudden everybody started saying 50. And so I'm a little concerned about that day, but uh, I, I don't see a lot of people taking big uh, bets right now. Lee? Well, I think we're in for volatility for a really long time. I don't think next week is going to be like this week. We're not going to have this newsworthy, record-setting move by the Fed that took everyone by surprise and made everyone think, my God, God, they're panicking well, too. Well, that only once in a lifetime. Well, exactly. I think that, that accounted for a lot of this week. Quentin, what do you think might happen? I mean, what, is, what does a Monday look like after a week that we had this time? 
Well, I think Bush will try and say something substantive in the State of the Union and lay out some policy. The Fed's got real news, you know. Uh, obviously, a lot of corporate earnings are coming out. That'll go in two directions. The retailers will show sensitivity. The tech guys seem a little bit immune. Anybody with international exposure is better off. Yeah, maybe Paris Hilton does something salacious, too. Actually, I'm getting nostalgic for those good old days, right? You know, remember when that was news? Now we're just going to roll a coaster and figure out what the hell any of this stuff is worth. It's going to take months sorting out what the hell any of this stuff is worth. So the volatility is just a given to me. Yeah, but John... Up 300, down 250, net 50. Okay, John Rutledge, usually a week when the Fed meets for its decision about whether it's going to let raise lower or keep the rates the same, it's a big news week, but it's going to be hard to eclipse this one. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I have no idea what's going to happen on Monday. There is a great deal of news coming out next week. Most important, probably from the Fed, I agree with Lee, we need 50 basis points. The president's going to ask for his tax cuts, cuts and get nothing. Uh, and on Tuesday, also, we get numbers from the uh, uh, Case-Shiller Home Price Index, which oh, yeah. is actually a better index than the ones we've seen this week. But this is a time to be calm. There are lots of bargains out there to be had. You just have to be very careful and buy in slowly. Where, for example? I think the financials have been sold down much too hard, no. and the good names have been sold down with the bad names. And so uh, I've bought a little bit there this week. I think some of the tech companies got sold down too hard this week, uh, Apple among them. Okay. And so uh, longer term, this is a time when you can add to a portfolio, not a time to sell from one. Jill, don't tell me what you don't like. Tell me what you do like and what you're buying for your clients. Remember on Monday when we were when, when everyone else was not working and we were, and you said to me, what should people buy? Mm -hmm. Right now, if you have a diversified portfolio, especially folks who have a 401k or a 403b account, or you're putting money into your IRA account, by the way, take those rebates and put it right into your IRA accounts, you should be looking at a broad-based U.S. index, a large cap. I said that on Monday. You should be nibbling. If you had Nibbled on, on Tuesday, you would have been pretty good. Peter's going to slam me right now. But for people who are longer-term investors, again, I think a diversified portfolio, having a little exposure to stocks is going to be just fine. Ten seconds, Peter. Well, yes, you can please. have exposure to stocks, just the right stocks. You don't want to be in anything that's related to American consumers either spending money or paying back the money they've mm -hmm. borrowed. Uh, you want to be in the exporters. You want to be in natural resources, metals, okay. industrial metals, precious metals, energy, agriculture. There's Makes all sense. sorts of places to invest. Makes and sense. we've got sectors struggling. But gold, of course, if Peter loves, it continues to glitter up about $7 right now. All right. Well, coming up, we're going to give you an update on available. Well, it seems like every time someone says gold's run is over, it just keeps going higher. The precious metal is once again trading in very lofty territory. It is now up at the moment by about... $7.40 to $913.20 a troy ounce. Even the experts, except for Peter, of course, have had a hard time predicting where it'll go next, as we will show you in just a second. However, our Fox panelist, Peter Schiff, is going to take a stab at it. He's back with us now. Okay, so we got to get to this Goldman Sachs story. And, and we, we put together some graphics so that people could understand it. November 29th of last year, 2007, Goldman Sachs, after saying that there had been a great run-up in gold, recommended to investors to short gold this year, 2008. But then, change the day of the calendar, less than two months later, January 11th, Goldman Sachs upgraded 2008 gold price forecast on, on weakness of the dollar and a few other things, and the average price outlook. What is an investor to make of this when they make a trade based on what happened on November 29th where Goldman said short gold now? Well, first of all, you have to realize that when brokerage firms publicly state something, you have no idea what they're actually doing. I mean, how do we know, you know what Goldman's motivation was? They said that shorting gold stocks was going to be the best trade of 2008. And so far, it's probably the worst. But how do you know Goldman wasn't trying to buy gold stocks? And they figured they'd talk it down a little bit. I mean, and you don't buy know. it cheaper. That's right. I mean, we you always, don't know that, by the no, way. No, I don't know that. But you don't. You don't. You just can't listen to somebody say something and say, "Oh, I'm going to do that," because you have no idea. You know, they they don't necessarily have a, any vested interest to people who happen to hear what they're talking about. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Goldman is the company that was actually betting both ways on the subprime mess. Well, sure. It, it actually made some money betting against yeah. the subprime securities. Uh, made about uh, four billion dollars, but lost about two billion dollars betting for it. So they may have been taking both sides. 
sides of this. Sure, but I'm sure that you know Goldman was pr talking to their clients and packaging these things and encouraging people to buy. At the same time, they were shorting them. Is that they, ethical? I, I don't know. I mean, it's a tough call. I mean, maybe they're not the same people. I mean, look, I don't know what was going on during Could the, the London office versus the U.S. But, yeah. but if I'm if I'm a Goldman investor and I'm a client. A, a client, and, mm -hmm. I, and I'm looking at these missives that come out, and I say on November 29th, oh gee, they're saying to short gold. Uh, these mm -hmm. guys are really smart. I'm going to follow yeah. that. Look, I mean, less you know, than two months later, had I had a longer short position, longer mm -hmm. in duration, yeah. aren't I burned? Yeah. yeah, I mean, of course, maybe Goldman could say we meant short it in January of 2008. Maybe they're saying we wanted you to wait for the rally. I don't know what their real strategy was, but you know, I've been buying gold since 1999 in gold stocks, and along the way, everybody is trying to call the top. And that's what happens. Just like in a bear market, everybody's prematurely trying to call the bottom, like we're having now in the stock market. People are trying to call the top in gold. We are nowhere near the top. This is going to be a replay of the 1970s, maybe bigger. Gold went up 24 times in that bull market, 24 times. We've only tripled so far. We're just getting started. But it's been on a run since the start of 2008 when Goldman said to start shorting it. We just want to mention this uh, hotel fire once again. We have water hoses now directed right at the fire that is at the Monte Carlo Casino right on the Las Vegas Strip. Apparently there were some workers trapped. You can see just below that rooftop area to the right, I believe, you see the water hoses going to the lower part of what appears to be the fire, probably mm -hmm. trying to stem any further spread it looks, of this. It looks like they are making some progress on that. Before, we just saw a raging flame that was coming out of those rooms, and apparently that rain, that, that flame has been quelled somewhat by, by the fire hoses, so we are hopeful about that. We haven't heard about whether those four workers who were trapped have been saved. In fact, uh, we've been contacting hospitals, or hospitals have been contacted by other news organizations. No reports yet of injury or fatalities. Back to this Goldman thing as we, as we continue to keep our eye on the Monte Carlo fire, Peter. What is the overall message here? Don't just believe every missive that comes out of a brokerage firm, no matter how brilliant the people are who run it. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, they don't have a great track record. I mean, look at Wall Street's touting all these dot-com stocks in the 1990s, and people got burned. And, and then they went out and touted all these subprime mortgages. And there's a lot of other debt that they've packaged uh, that is also going to collapse. So you've got you know, you to do your own homework, right. especially Quickly, when the price of gold a year from now? Well, what it's going to be a lot higher. I don't know how much higher, but it's going to be a lot higher. All right, Peter, thanks very much. We should point out that we invited Goldman Sachs to provide a representative to come on with us, but they did decline. Goldman also declined to provide us with a statement. We'll be right back with the latest on the fire in Vegas.